What you're about to hear is the third episode of our series, Ends of the Earth, an exploration of some of the efforts undertaken by those who attempted to explore and conquer the Earth's polar extremities. If you're a first-time listener, and there have been quite a few of you lately, so welcome, or in case you haven't listened to the first two episodes of Ends of the Earth, I'd like to welcome you to the show. While it isn't necessary to have listened to the first two episodes to enjoy today's topic, I will note that they do provide a lot of context to what we'll be covering. In those episodes, we explored who Sir John Barrow was and why he was obsessed with finding a trade route through Canada's Arctic archipelago, and how he used his immense power as Second Secretary of the Admiralty to launch a new era of British Arctic exploration. We also took a look at Sir John Franklin and examined more closely his disastrous overland search for the passage that ended with him being known as the man who ate his boots. But what became of him after this? And what happened to the 22 long years that stand between the Coppermine expedition and his final voyage? Before we explore Franklin's last foray into Canada, we need to take a closer look at the prelude to what would become one of the most discussed journeys in all of Arctic exploration. Because John Franklin's last expedition, and the last to be authorized by John Barrow, was designed to map the last of the Canadian coastline and finally uncover the mythic Northwest Passage to the other side of the world. It was designed to open Britain to new sea routes and save John Franklin's tarnished reputation, leaving him a legacy that would last through the centuries. I don't want to give away the ending, but all of these things did indeed come to pass, just not in the way that anyone expected or hoped. Now, The Man Who Ate His Boots is back, and this month we are going to be reviewing his final expedition into the Arctic, which was also the final expedition John Barrow authorized to search for the Northwest Passage. This was to be the penultimate mission that would see the last of Canada's coastline mapped, and Britain gloriously taking command of a new shipping route. It was also to be the capstone of Franklin's career, a sort of redemption to an aging man with a tarnished reputation and sagging fortune. One last voyage to secure his respect, his finances, and to weave a shining legacy. I don't want to give the ending away, but if any of that were true, we probably wouldn't be discussing it here on Grizzly History. But let's now take a look at what occurred in the Arctic in the 22 years between the survivors of the Coppermine Expedition's return home in 1823 and before the launch of Franklin's last expedition in 1845. Franklin had just returned from a trip that took two years longer than scheduled to complete, killed 11 men through starvation and murder, and saw the survivors eating roasted boot leather to survive. What do you suppose was in store for him next? Well, you might find it somewhat astonishing, but after returning home to glorious fanfare in Britain and co-authoring a book about the experience with John Barrow, he signed up to lead yet another overland expedition across Canada in quest for the passage. Despite having little to show for such a disastrous expedition, the Admiralty still maintained faith in Franklin's ability to organize and lead men, and so they sent him back to the Arctic coast, this time to explore the West. I won't dive too deeply into his 1825 Mackenzie River expedition, but it essentially went like this. Franklin had learned much about how to travel in Canada and negotiate with fur companies and native peoples from his previous adventure. So he once again chose John Richardson to be his second-in-command, as well as George Back to serve as a subordinate officer, and together they hiked halfway across Canada to reach Great Slave Lake, where this time they took the much straighter and smoother Mackenzie River to the Arctic shore. The men of this trip traveled east, to the peninsula that had stopped the previous mapping journey towards Hudson Bay. They mapped the Kent Peninsula and turned back west, sailing all the way to Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, mapping 620 miles of new coastline in the process. This was a far more successful trip than Coppermine, as it not only mapped more of the coast, but it only took two years and, more importantly, no one had died. The success of the Mackenzie expedition left a roughly 300-mile stretch of Canada's northern shore unmapped which put the mythical Northwest Passage evermore within the Empire's reach. Now, before going any further, let me briefly attempt to describe these crucial unknown 300 miles to you. As with the Coppermine episode, this is probably going to be a bit confusing without a map. I'm going to give it my best to give you a basic picture of the area, but if you want a more comprehensive look, go to our social media pages for a more detailed view of the geography of the area. 
So from east to west, the area in question sits at the top of the modern province of Nunavut and consists first of a 400-mile-long peninsula called the Boothia Peninsula. The water to its east is called Prince Regent Inlet, and in order to get around it, a ship must sail north to the Perry Channel, and then down Peel Sound, a relatively narrow waterway that runs between the peninsula and Prince of Wales Island. Now from here, a ship would have two options. First, it could sail west through Victoria Sound, which would take it south of Victoria Island, and eventually north over the Kent Peninsula, where it would be a straight shot over Canada's northern shore into the Arctic and the Pacific Oceans. The other option would be to sail due south and circle King William Island, before then proceeding west in the same manner. Now, we know all of that today, but this was not known to European explorers at the time. What they further did not know was that the area was one of the most treacherous places for a ship in the Arctic, that often stays frozen for years, because it acts as a depository for all of the ice in the north to flow down into as it warms and breaks into flows. I mentioned this in our copper mine episode, but I think it bears repeating here. Ice flows can be as thick as 10 feet and weigh thousands of tons. When a ship would winter in the Arctic, it was important that they find a bay or harbor out of the way of the primary waterways, as the ice there would usually break up and flow south as the summer thaw came on. If they failed to find harbor, an ice flow could capture a ship and push it wherever it floated, potentially beaching the ship on shore or crushing it against another flow. While Franklin continued his overland expeditions, Captain William Perry continued to approach the passage from the sea. You may remember me saying in the last episode that Perry had incredibly good fortune during his leg of the copper mine expedition. His success saw him sailing halfway through the archipelago, farther west than anyone ever had before. He had traveled through what would go on to be called the Perry Channel, a waterway that neatly divides the northern and southern halves of the archipelago. Ice prevented him from reaching the coast to meet Franklin as planned, so he returned to England and completed a second expedition in the time it took Franklin to complete his portion of the copper mine journey. As it happened, Perry was in the midst of a nine-year marathon of continuous polar exploration and wasted no time setting back out to explore Prince Regent Inlet. He did not know it, but this was the entrance that would lead to the last and most difficult 300 miles of the North American coastline. Perry had been riding high, but his 1824 expedition saw not only the worst disaster of his career, but also the Admiralty's greatest loss at that time in the Arctic. Perry left England with two ships, HMS's Fury and Helica, the same converted bomb vessels he had used to discover and name new Arctic waters in past expeditions. He brought along on this trip James Clark Ross and Francis Crozier, men who would go on to become well-known Antarctic explorers in their own rights one day. As the ships approached the Arctic from Greenland in the summer of 1824, they were delayed by ice so badly that they did not even enter Lancaster Sound until September 10th, the very time in which Arctic summer draws to a close and its waters freeze solid. They made it about 60 miles in before being forced to seek a bay to winter until the next year's thaw. Food and other provisions were not a problem, as it was by this time expected that any voyage to the Arctic should provision for two years given the high probability that ships would become frozen in. The winter passed slowly for the men, but the long-awaited thaw finally came the following July. And when it came, they resumed their journey northwest, attempting to reach the Perry Channel to get up and over the Boothia Peninsula. But it was a bad year for ice, and endless flows stopped them in their tracks. They tried to retreat back south, but they were overtaken by ice and wind. In the frozen torrent, they couldn't turn away, and both ships were eventually dashed against a beach on the eastern shore of the Boothia. Helica made it through the ordeal relatively unscathed, but her sister Fury had her keel hopelessly broken beyond repair. As the ice and wind continued to pick up, the men of the Fury offloaded what valuables were on the ship and laid out their food stores and extra rigging on the beach, cached in case it would be needed in the future. Perry took the refugees aboard Helica, and they sailed away from the barren rocky beach back to England. The loss of HMS Fury was something of a wake-up call to the Admiralty as to just how dangerous Arctic ice can be. By God's grace, no one had died as a result of the beaching, but if Helica had not been close by, it may have been a very different story. The Navy made a note of the wreck site, and Fury Beach, as it came to be called, was etched onto the maps of naval and whaling vessels alike. In a fascinating turn, Perry's misfortune would go on to be another captain's salvation almost a decade later during the calamitous four-year expedition into the Victoria Strait. 
Captain Sir John Ross was an interesting character in the story of Arctic exploration. He was the uncle of the previously mentioned Sir James Ross, who would go on to outshine his uncle as an explorer of the Antarctic. But as for John Ross's own career, he was a lifelong Navy man, having joined the service at the tender age of nine. Like many officers after the Napoleonic Wars, he was keen to keep his career alive and so sought out the command of an expedition. John Barrow gave him his first expedition in 1818 when he went in search of the Northwest Passage through Lancaster Sound. Like many an Arctic expedition, Ross's was halted by ice, but looking out west, he thought he saw a mountain range, one I should mention that no one else on the expedition saw. He returned to Britain and wrote a book about his conclusions, naming the supposed mountain range in honor of the Admiralty's first secretary, John Crocker. Skeptical of this, William Perry went up to Lancaster Sound himself, sailed through the non-existent Crocker Mountains, and as consequence discovered the Perry Channel. Ross's reputation was left in tatters, and John Barrow never gave him command of another expedition. Eleven years later, Ross convinced a gin magnate to fund an expedition in which he would take a steamship, he named Victory, to sail into Prince Regent Inlet and look for a passage in the still unknown south. Ross took with him his nephew James, and they set sail with the intention of spending two years exploring the area. They left in May of 1829 and sailed to Fury Beach, where they discovered the hulk of the ship was gone, likely carried away by pack ice before sinking. They took food and other supplies from there and continued south to the unknown Gulf of Boothia, where he wintered that year. Come the following spring, Victory sailed north up and over Boothia and down to a relatively large island. The island was unknown at the time, and ice prevented Ross from actually confirming whether or not it was an island. He instead assumed that it was part of the mainland, and so mapped it with the title of King William Land, in an attempt to flatter Britain's newly ascended King William IV. Ross's mislabeling of King William Land would stay on the books for the next dozen years and would become a crucial part of what befell Franklin's later expedition. Ice prevented victory from continuing any farther west, and so the unknown 300 miles of Arctic coast remained just that, unknown. However, the expedition did discover the magnetic North Pole. And just a quick word to anyone who might be unaware, but the magnetic North Pole is not located at the geographic North Pole. Essentially, there is a magnetic field between a point in the Earth's northern hemisphere and one in its southern hemisphere. And as I said, these points are not actually located at the Earth's geographic north and south poles, but rather they drift around the extreme latitudes, moving at a rate of approximately 9 miles a year. A consequence of being near the magnetic north pole is that compasses will dip and become increasingly less helpful the closer you get to it. This phenomenon would go on to create difficulties for future voyages in the area, but its discovery did at least help explorers to better understand what difficulties awaited them as they charted their voyage. With food stores beginning to run low, the Victory tried sailing back to England, but was forced to harbor on the southeast side of the Boothia from the endless ice flowing south. Months passed with no sign of Inuit to trade with, and by January of 1832 it became apparent that if the crew remained there, they would all surely die of scurvy or starvation. In May, they unloaded the bare essentials from Victory and piled them along with the ship's smaller boats onto sledges and manhauled everything 200 miles north across the frozen ocean and rocky shore to Fury Beach. Their hope was that the Royal Navy would be out looking for them and would think to remember the site where Fury had been lost and left supplies. After months of sledging, they arrived in midsummer, taking rest and replenishing their health with leftover stores. The next phase of the plan was to drag the smaller boats north and then sail them out to sea to get the attention of whalers to rescue them. But after waiting for four weeks, it became apparent that the ice would not break up, and so they battened down for a winter on the beach. After ten months, the waters finally opened up in summer of 1833, and that August, after a week and a half on the ocean, they were finally spotted by a whaler. When John Ross introduced himself to their rescuers, the ship's mate responded incredulously, Captain Ross has been dead these two years. They had all been given up for dead. As it turned out, John Barrow had been indifferent to the expedition's fate. It had been undertaken apart from the Admiralty's oversight and funding, and what's more, Barrow didn't care for Ross. But the British newspaper stirred on the public, and under pressure, the Admiralty had eventually sent an overland rescue expedition led by George Back, which found no trace of the men. And so it was with great surprise and fanfare that the Ross expedition returned home that October of 1833 
after four grueling years and having lost only three men. Much happened in the aftermath of Ross's expedition's rescue, but the most important point was that it forced the Admiralty to consider what they would do the next time a ship needed rescue. The archipelago's interior was dangerous and fickle. The openness of its channels could not be predicted with any certainty. One year they may be open, and the next year frozen solid. If then a ship became trapped within, there was no guarantee that a rescue party could sail in after it. The only possibility, then, was for the crews to either walk east back to Baffin Bay or south to a river along the coast that could bring the crews back to civilization. Going forward, the Navy considered Fury Beach as a place of possible refuge should other ships be lost and its crews in need of immediate access to food, and therefore determined that all future expeditions should cache food and other materials anywhere along the journey that was convenient in case they needed to retrace their steps back towards rescue. A decade came and went since victory's loss, and Arctic exploration by sea slowed to a crawl. By 1845, Sir John Barrow was beginning to feel the sum of his 81 years upon him. It was clear to most everyone around him that he was in need of retirement, and even he conceded that the time had come to put his more than 40-year career to bed. But his mind still lingered on the one goal he had been unable to obtain, no matter how much money, no matter how many men and ships he threw at it, the Northwest Passage. With his time in the Admiralty quickly drawing to a close, he could not leave without outfitting just one more expedition to sail to the far north and conquer one of the Earth's last unknown areas. So in early 1845, Barrow put his plan into action. An expedition would sail that May, first to Greenland and then into Lancaster Sound, where depending on ice conditions, the ships would either sail north to the hypothetical open polar sea or south into the unknown 300 miles and then west along Canada's northern coast. The expedition would be composed of two ships and a crew of roughly 130 men and officers. The ships chosen were HMS's Erebus and Terror, ships with a long and storied history in both Arctic and Antarctic exploration. The Terror had been under command of George Back during his 1836 exploration of Hudson Bay and both ships have been part of Sir James Ross's four-year expedition into the Antarctic, where both had volcanoes and gulfs named for them there. The ships were a little more than 30 years old at this point, converted bomb ships retrofitted with steam technology for prolonged use in Arctic conditions. In addition to the reinforced planking, both ships had iron plating 20 feet back from their bows. The iron served not only as protection from oncoming ice, but also as a wedge for the ships to break through the ice with the help of their steam engines. With converted locomotive engines, 25 and 20 horsepower respectively, Erebus and Terror were going to do some ice breaking, hopefully allowing them to go farther than they normally could at the beginning of a big freeze-up or thaw. Additionally, the ships had a network of pipes that allowed them to move hot water through the decks, providing some much-needed warmth in a winter that could get as cold as negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The ships would be heartily provisioned as well. This time, instead of the standard two years' worth of food, they would have three, Five years' worth they had to cut back to half rations. The majority of the food would be canned, provided by whichever canning company bid the lowest. To top it all off, the crews would never go thirsty, as both ships had water filtration for turning salt water into fresh water. A plan was set and the ships were chosen. The only question left to answer is who would lead this expedition. Barrow's first choice was James Clark Ross the dashing captain that had been knighted for his exploration of Antarctica and proved himself chivalrous in the investigation to the loss of victory 15 years earlier. However, Sir James was not interested, as when he had returned from the far south, he promised his young bride-to-be that he would retire from polar exploration and had no intention of breaking his vow. Barrow's second choice was the up-and-coming James Fitz James. Fitzjames was only 31, but had already had a lively career filled with danger and adventure. He had joined the Navy at the age of 12 and served some years. He had joined the Navy at the age of 12 and served for some years before taking some time off to join an expedition down the Euphrates River. He rejoined the Navy and earned the respect of his superiors and common men alike as he led daring raids, first against the Egyptians during the Egyptian Ottoman War, and then Chinese forces during the Opium Wars. He was well-liked and well-respected all around the Navy, but by 1845 he was still a mere lieutenant, and what's more, the Admiralty thought that he was too young to lead an expedition of this nature. The third choice, then, was Captain Francis Crozier. 
Crozier had more than nine years of Arctic and Antarctic exploration under his belt, and had even captained HMS Terror on James Ross's expedition to the Arctic. He knew what these ships could do, and had a proven instinct for navigating frozen waters. But alas, Crozier was Irish, and it just wouldn't do to have anyone but an Englishman discover the long-coveted passage. And so Crozier was passed over in favor of Barrow's fourth choice, Sir John Franklin. Much had happened in Franklin's life since the long-ago expedition down the copper mine. He had, for instance, returned home to marry a Miss Eleanor Porton, a modern woman who spent her free time attending university lectures taught by leading English scholars in the latest scientific fields, as well as devouring the romantic literature of her day. Unfortunately, Eleanor caught that most famous killer of the Romantic era, consumption, or what we would call tuberculosis today. She and Franklin had a daughter, also named Eleanor, but after two years, she was clearly on death's doorstep. Franklin was racked with indecision as to whether or not he should stay with Eleanor until she passed on, or to go ahead and join his Mackenzie River expedition, which had already begun to leave. Eleanor knew how much the expedition meant to him, and so encouraged him to go, sewing him a flag to plant once he reached the mouth of the river. For two months of his transatlantic voyage, he wrote her letters every day, intending to send them back at the first opportunity. Instead, when the time came to send mail, he received a letter informing him that she had died five days after he set sail. Upon Franklin's return, he took comfort in one of Eleanor's closest friends, Lady Jane Griffin, a wealthy heiress who dressed in the latest fashions and also zealously read the latest romantic novels. Together, the Franklins traveled across Europe, received and revered by nobility across the continent, to hear stories of Franklin's travels. Throughout their marriage, Jane would simultaneously insert herself into Franklin's work and, at the same time, bid adieu for long periods to pursue her own interests. This included traveling with Protestant missionaries down the Nile River and traveling with her own entourage to Morocco, the first European lady to do so in living memory. As for Franklin's career, he worked on and off. In 1830, three years after his return from the Mackenzie River expedition, Franklin went on to serve as a sort of quasi-diplomat in the newly independent Greece. It was there that he helped to keep the peace through what means the British Navy could until the fledgling country found a king in 1833. After that, Franklin took four years off, doing little until securing a post in Van Diemen's land, what is today known as Tasmania, to serve as governor of Britain's last penal colony. During their time there, the Franklins attempted to bring culture and modest reform to a place where the prisoners were little more than slave labor for the island's plantations. Unfortunately, they were never well-liked in the colony, where most of the administration was still loyal to the previous governor. After a petty dispute in which Franklin fired a subordinate with close ties to the foreign office back in London, he was recalled in 1842, and so the Franklins returned to England the following year. During Franklin's last year in Tasmania, he was visited by the then-returning Ross expedition from Antarctica. Ross and his second-in-command, Crozier, regaled the Franklins with tales of their discoveries. Sir John was riveted. It had been 15 years since he'd done any exploring, but the Arctic had never strayed far from his mind. And now, with these younger explorers in his home, he had begun to turn over the prospect of returning to the far north. Back in England, he had few prospects. He was 59 years old, obese, and had not held command of a ship in more than a decade. His career was nearly over, and he had little to show for it. Certainly, his wife's fortune was more than enough to ensure that they would live comfortably for the rest of their lives. But Franklin wanted something he could call his own. When he heard that John Barrow was putting together a final expedition in search of the Northwest Passage, he saw a chance to cap off his career with a handsome title and sizable income from the book he would inevitably publish upon his return. With some reluctance, the Admiralty selected Franklin to lead the expedition, with Francis Crozier and James Fitzjames acting as his second and third in command, respectively. On May 19th, the 134 men of the Sir John Franklin expedition left port to begin the first leg of their journey north to Greenland. Scores of people flocked to the docks to say goodbye and wave as the ships left harbor. It had seemed at the time that they may have been departing under a bad omen, as Lady Jane had, as Franklin's first wife Eleanor, sewn him a flag to plant when he discovered the passage. The evening before he was to leave, Franklin fell asleep dozing in his chair. And when Lady Jane saw him, she draped the flag over him like a blanket. Franklin awoke a short time later and scolded her, saying, Don't you know they put a Union Jack over a corpse? But this day, as the ships were sailing from the docks, his daughter Eleanor pointed to the top of the ship and shouted, 
The officers turned in time to see a white gull leaping from its perch and flying before the ships. And so it seemed that all was right again. They sailed for the better part of thirty days before reaching Disco Island on the western side of Greenland. It was here that the crew slaughtered ten oxen to carry along as fresh meat, as well as to send their final letters home before heading into the passage. Along with the letters, they sent home five crewmen who were deemed too sick to continue along with the expedition, bringing their number down to twenty-nine. After leaving Disco, the ships were blocked by ice in Baffin Bay, and so they passed a couple of days conversing with whaling ships and waiting for the opportunity to enter into Lancaster Sound. Finally, in late July of 1845, conditions improved, and the men sailed on in high spirits, ready for the adventure and glory of being the first to pass through the long-sought-after Northwest Passage. The door creaks to a close behind you as you step into the officer's mess. As you remove your great coat and cold-weather slops, you listen to the chorus of other creaks and groans throughout the ship as the pack ice outside grinds against the hull, shifting its pressure around the frame. Through puffs of your own breath, you make your way to the long table at the center of the room, slide into one of the chairs, and reach inside your valise for your pipe and tobacco pouch. According to the latest temperature readings, the air outside is somewhere around negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but with the endless, unobstructed wind, it feels more like negative 100 above decks. That's where you've just come from, blessedly released from watch duty by the supervising officer and men of the morning watch. Now at 4 a.m., they will stand through the dead belly of Arctic night in the cold hours before your shipmates are roused for their breakfast and morning duties. You know that bedding down yourself would be useless, as there isn't a chance of warming up enough to sleep in the icy sheets between now and four bells. And even if that were somehow possible, you doubt you could sleep after this past afternoon's meeting with the expedition's doctors aboard the flagship. With shaking fingers, you strike your match until a flame ignites and slowly light the pipe, biting down on the stem and breathing in deeply as you do so. The nicotine hits immediately, and your sleep-deprived, wind-addled brain begins to buzz as your lungs breathe out the fire. The warmth is a passing pleasance, as apart from the engine room and cook stove, the temperatures below decks never rises above freezing in the winter. You wish you had a glass of brandy like they doled out at this afternoon's meeting of the officers. Perhaps then you could warm up enough to think about something other than the cold. As you puff out a wreath of smoke, your mind drifts back to the great room, where all four ship's surgeons stood to deliver a double-barrel shot of bad news. First was the obvious and most dreaded, scurvy. It was the first time in two and a half years that anyone had so much as muttered the word. And yet there could be no doubt that of the seventeen men in either ship's sickbay, almost all of them were showing advanced symptoms. Worse yet, every day it seems like more men are beginning to show the first sign of every sailor's worst nightmare. It starts with a feeling of constant weakness and irritability, traits that are easy enough to overlook given a seaman's revolving work hours. But then a dull ache settles into your joints as they start to swell, as do your gums. Teeth will begin to come loose and fall out. Reflexively, you run your tongue along your own bottom molars and feel one on your right side wiggling. As the condition progresses, you will begin to bruise more easily, and small cuts picked up during your daily duties will be quick to bleed. In the moistureless arctic air, your dry skin will be more prone to abrasions. Your scalp will be bloody each time you remove your skull cap, as will your hand each time you attend to your necessaries. Eventually, decades-old scars will open back up, and by the end of it, you'll be little more than a bleeding mess on the doctor's cot. When asked why the gallons of lemon juice brought along on the expedition for just this purpose was failing to arrest the symptoms, the ship's surgeon simply shrugged. For some unknown reason, the antisorbutic properties of the juice seems to have lessened over the course of the voyage. Also having lessened over the course of the voyage are the dwindling food stores, dwindled still further according to the doctor's second grim revelation. At least a quarter of the remaining ten foods have gone putrid. There were signs early on that the canned goods, purchased by the Navy from the lowest bidder, were improperly prepared. Cans would be opened and emit a vile odor, and others would have their soldering mixed in with the food. Still more would swell and their contents proved to be inedible. The surgeon surmised that in the canner's haste to fulfill the expedition's order of 8,000 cans in less than three months, 
Some of the foods and soups had not been properly heated, hence leading them to spoil. You notice that your pipe has gone out and begin to strike another match. You bite down on the stem and the coppery taste of blood mixes with smoke as you relight the bowl. The diagnosis, then, was an immediate need for fresh food. Fresh food, according to the doctors, is the only remedy to turning back scurvy and keeping you all fed. But where was fresh food to be found? The hunting parties that go out each month only rarely come back with one or two of the white arctic bears, which all the men hate to eat. The mead is always gamey, and as you all discovered last winter, eating the liver would make a man violently ill. And what about the Eskimo? In all those hunting trips, the men had never seen so much as one parka-clad native to trade with. Your eyes move about the room, glancing at the fine silverware, silk cloths, and ornate china pieces. The expedition had enough trinkets to make any native clan the wealthiest tribesman in the whole north, and yet there were none to be seen. You grip the sides of your chair and bite down hard on the stem of the pipe as you wrestle with the hard questions. Will the sea thaw enough this year to navigate out of this ice maze? Will you have enough food to survive until then? Even if you keep the men fed, will any of you be strong enough to man the ships come summer? And of course, how will you keep the men in line once the rum ration runs out and every meal consists of moldy ship's biscuits? Suddenly you hear a crunch and there's something hard in your mouth. You pull your pipe away and spit on the table. There, in the flickering candlelight, you see a smattering of blood and your first missing tooth. And that's it. That is the last that anyone ever saw of them. Her Majesty's ships, Erebus and Terror, were lost, along with the crews never to be seen again. To this day, we still don't know the full story of what befell them, and in all probability, we will never know. We're going to cover the remains of this topic a bit differently than we normally do. With the remaining time in this episode, I'm going to recount the rescue efforts undertaken by the Admiralty and private citizens to find the expedition, and briefly discuss the legacy of its loss. In the next episode, my producer Michael and I are going to sit down and discuss the artifacts that have been found in the last 170 years, and examine the theories that have been put forth by Franklin experts. With that said, let's get back to the story. 1846 turned to 1847 and no word of Franklin Expedition had been received. No letters from Far Eastern Kamchatka or China, and no brass cylinders containing the ship's coordinates were found off of Canada's eastern shore. This surprised few, as Franklin himself had opined that the crew's families back in Britain likely wouldn't receive their first letters until October of 1847. The first to raise concerns was John Ross, who at the age of 69 had declined a full retirement just in case he may be called upon to lead a rescue effort for the expedition. He wrote to the Admiralty in January, stating that a rescue party should be mounted to either Cornwallis or Melville Islands, those are islands along the Perry Channel, as he believed that the ships had almost certainly fallen victim to the southward flowing ice. He wrote to the Admiralty in January, stating that a rescue effort should be mounted to either Cornwallis or Melville Islands, islands that are along the Perry Channel, as he believed that the ships had almost certainly fallen victim to the southward flowing ice. The Admiralty brushed off Ross's concern and outwardly maintained their confidence in the expedition's journey. However, in May, they began to quietly consult the Arctic Knights about what a rescue operation might look like. Also in May, a British paper published an open letter from Richard King, a man who had previously explored the Arctic, calling on the Colonial Office to launch a rescue effort then and there, as another year in the ice could mean the deaths of all the men if they were well and truly really stuck. Then in November, a month after Franklin said that they might be heard from, papers began to report on the findings of one Dr. John Ray, an explorer in the Hudson's Bay Company employee who had just returned from the still unmapped stretch of Canada's northern shore. Ray had traveled overland the previous year to prove once and for all whether or not there was a strait from the Gulf of Boothia to the Chantre Inlet. Though he could not prove so conclusively, he believed that based on the evidence of Inuit testimony and his own studies of the area, that there was no such strait. If this was true, it meant that if the Franklin expedition had been unable to continue north through the Perry Channel and had instead turned south to the still unknown 300 miles of Canadian coastline, that his ships would not have been able to retreat back east if the water to their north had frozen. 
Instead, the ships would be trapped in a basin where, once the waters thawed for approximately two months, ice would continuously flow south and collect there as it broke up, making for treacherous waters to try to navigate out of. On top of all of this, none of the Inuit Ray spoke with reported hearing of white men or big ships in the area. And word apparently traveled far and wide in the Arctic, so this suggested that if the expedition was in trouble, that they had been unable to trade with or otherwise consult the Inuit. Ray's report alarmed not just the public at large, but also the tenacious Lady Jane Franklin, who had begun to use her influence to rouse the Admiralty to take action. Behind closed doors, the Admiralty was already busy calculating how many ships they should send and how much time the expedition realistically had left. They calculated that if Franklin had run into trouble and cut down on his daily food rations, the party might have enough provisions to last them until the summer of 1849. However, the Arctic is about as large as continental Europe, and at this time there were still many islands of unknown sizes and straits and channels of unknown lengths. There were many places the expedition could be, and the rescuers sent out would need to be precise if there was any hope of actually locating the survivors. The Admiralty therefore decided that they would send out three teams with three different search areas. The first would sail around South America and approach from the Pacific, whereupon they would search around the coastline of the Mackenzie River on the western side of Canada. The Erebus and Terror could very well be lying battered on any one of the islands or coastlines, and its crews could be attempting to make their way south, either by small boat or by sledge to the Mackenzie and attempt to sail to a fur trading post. This team was led by Henry Collette, who left for the Bering Strait in early 1848. The second expedition would go overland, with men traveling to Great Slave Lake and down the Mackenzie River, in case the crews of Erebus and Terror had abandoned their ships and taken to the river. This was led by John Ray, as well as John Richardson, who had served as Franklin's second-in-command on his previous overland expeditions. They left for Canada in February of 1848. And finally, a third expedition would see James Clark Ross coming out of Arctic retirement and leading two ships into Lancaster Sound in an attempt to follow the ambiguous path Franklin was supposed to have taken. The saga of the searches for the Franklin expedition is immense, with many a turn and twist. For the sake of brevity, I cannot recount them here in any major detail. However, I think Anthony Brandt summed it up best in his book, The Man Who Ate His Boots when he described the first searches as confused, difficult, and time-consuming. The saga of the searches for the Franklin expedition is immense, with many a turn and twist. To keep things simple, I will briefly sum up the progress of the rescue expeditions. James Ross's expedition immediately ran into heavy ice before entering into the Arctic. The ships were delayed in Baffin Bay for quite some time and only just made it to Somerset Island, just north of the Boothia Peninsula, before being forced to winter there in late August. The following summer, he tried sailing around Somerset, down the newly discovered waterway that they named Peel Sound. The sound led to the coastline, but Ross found it so choked with ice, he didn't believe that there was any way that Franklin could have sailed there in 1846. He instead turned north to try to follow Franklin's primary orders to sail through or north of the Perry Channel, but once again, ice turned him back leaving the expedition to return to England in 1849. The Ray Richardson expedition arrived in Canada in March of 1848. In three months, they traveled over 800 miles, passing through three modern provinces before reaching Great Slave Lake, the source of the Mackenzie River. For five weeks, the party sailed down the river looking for any sign of Franklin's expedition and finding none. Even the Inuit they passed told them that they had not heard of any white people or seen any great ships in the area. Determined to press on, they sailed east along the coast until the weather became too volatile. And so in mid-September, they cached food by the Dolphin and Union Strait, hoping that any survivors may happen upon it, before returning to a winter encampment. Richardson, who was 61 years old at this point, returned to England the following summer. While Ray would keep on searching until 1854, more or less using the Franklin party as an excuse to continue doing his own exploring. Meanwhile, through all of this, the ships that had approached from the Pacific had not been heard from, and as 1850 approached, it was feared that a rescue effort may be required to locate them as well. Throughout these rescue attempts, Lady Jane Franklin had been hard at work 
touring, writing, and otherwise raising funds to further the searches for her husband. She put up a £3,000 reward to any credible fine that would lead to the expedition's discovery. This was on top of Parliament's £10,000 reward for the same thing, and £20,000 reward to anyone who brought back a survivor. As the would-be rescuers began filtering back into England in 1849, she set out with renewed vigor to send another wave of ships to the far north. John Ross realized that the Admiralty was never going to give him command of a rescue expedition, and so instead he turned to Lady Jane, persuading her that he was the man to lead the next search if she could procure a ship and crew. Lady Jane quickly put her indomitable spirit to work and obtained the now 72-year-old Ross a vessel and crew. Before the next wave of ships went north in 1850, she even wrote to President Zachary Taylor, imploring him on humanitarian grounds to join in the search. The United States Navy did not join in the search. However, a shipping magnate named Henry Grinnell did outfit two of his ships to sail with the eight other British ships. This second wave of searches was marked by captains putting their egos above practicality and worse ice conditions than usual slowing down their search. The ships navigated mazes of ice, unsure if they were discovering sounds or straits, islands or lands. It was a random foray into the high and mid-Arctic, like darts thrown at a board. The conditions were merciless, and by this point the Franklin crew had been missing for five years on about three years' worth of food. If there were any survivors left, they would have to be found that year. From the start, the ships were detained by ice in Baffin Bay before reaching the entrance of the Arctic. Once they were free, they sailed as far as the Wellington Channel, just north of the Perry Channel, before being frozen in within sight of one another. That winter, they took to the ice and searched for the party by sledge. They searched nearby Devon Island, and there, on a desolate beach just off the coast, the first sign of the lost expedition was discovered by Dr. Robert Goodsir, brother of the Franklin Expedition's surgeon, Henry Goodsir. As Goodsir walked along the empty shore, he saw three little monoliths rising out of the rocky soil. As he got closer, he realized that what he was looking at were the headstones for three men of the Franklin Expedition. An examination of the headstones identified the buried men as Stoker John Torrington, Seaman John Hartnell, and Marine Private William Brain, all of whom had died between New Year's Day to April 3rd of 1846. The rescuers scoured the island and came across broken bottles, more than 600 empty cans, and amazingly, sledge marks nearly five years old at this point heading north. There was also an empty cairn, a collection of stacked rocks which normally held brass cylinders with messages, but no message was inside. What all this told the rescuers was that the Franklin expedition must have spent the winter of 1845 to 1846 here and had attempted to examine the ice north trying to follow Franklin's primary orders. But questions remained. Like, why had three men died that winter? Three was the highest death toll on any of the recent sea-based expeditions into the Arctic, so why had three died so soon into the voyage? With no written record left behind, the Ross party could only guess as to their fate. As early spring of 1851 wore on, the expedition attempted to get the attention of any hypothetical survivors that might be in the area. They did this by firing rockets into the air along with balloons with long burning matches at the bottom that released colored paper as it burned, the farthest piece making it about 50 miles from the ship. In April, they took a hands-on approach, which saw hundreds of men getting into harness and heading out onto the ice to look for survivors. They searched for hundreds of miles in various directions, leading to a number of men having to have their feet amputated and at least one dying of exhaustion. Hundreds of miles of sea ice and convoluted coastline was explored, and not one artifact was discovered in the process. In June, the thaw came, and many of the ships returned back to England. After six years, only the most die-hard Franklin supporters still believed that there was any hope of finding a survivor. The public and the Admiralty both gradually began to accept that continued searches were a dangerous gamble of men's lives and resources. Between 1852 and 1854, several of the rescue ships gone looking for the expedition had to be abandoned in the ice, leaving their commanders to return home in shame and to court-martial. One of these ships was the HMS Resolute, and it had quite an interesting story. 
After being abandoned in the ice, it was discovered by an American whaler who towed it back to Connecticut intent on selling it for salvaging rights. However, he was a good sport, and along the way, he flagged down a British ship and gave the crew the previous captain's belongings to be forwarded to him in the East Indies. When the whaler arrived back in Connecticut, the British Navy waived their rights to the ship. But, rather than salvage, shipping magnate Henry Grinnell suggested to Congress that they should buy it and return it to England. Congress approved this notion, and they refurbished the Resolute and sailed it back to Britain at no charge just before Christmas of 1856. Britons were roundly touched by this friendly gesture, and in 1880, after the Resolute was broken up, Queen Victoria had a desk made for the remains of the ship and sent it back to America. And the so-called Resolute Desk has gone on to be the desk of many presidents since then. In the spring of 1854, war with Crimea loomed on the horizon for Great Britain, and needing every ship and able seamen at their disposal, the Navy ended its searches for the Franklin Expedition. Future searches would instead consist of privately funded volunteers. However, interest in the Franklin Expedition did not die away, as that very year, John Ray, who had been exploring the Arctic for nearly six years, returned with news of the expedition's fate. In his travels, Ray had sledged to the still unmapped portion of Canada's northern shoreline, and spoke with Inuit there, who told stories of white people, who they called Kabluna, that had died on an island there and had abandoned their great ships. As it turned out, the land just north of the Canadian coastline, previously known as King William Land, was actually King William Island. Inuit in that area showed Ray such items as silverware with the initials FRM Crozier and other pieces that could have only come from the Franklin Expedition, and told him that they had taken it from a camp of dead Kabluna on the island. Ray put up a bounty to any Inuit that came forward with artifacts and spent the spring of 1854 continuing towards the coastline just south of the island. Along the way, he encountered Inuit wearing officers' caps and eating off of China, all of whom told him the same general story, that four or five years prior, a camp of 45 to 50 Kabluna were found on the south side of King William Island. These Kabluna were lean and desperate, trading whatever they had for food. The head of the Kabluna, a man that sounded a lot like second-in-command Captain Crozier, pleaded for the Inuit to stay, but they feared that they would kill them or steal their food, so they left them in the spring. When the Inuit returned later in the summer, the Kabluna were dead, with bones sitting in cook pots and body parts arranged around tents. The bodies of five other Kabluna were found on an island south near the shore of the mainland. Ray went on to collect plates, silverware, coins a bronze medal Franklin received for his service in Greece, and the myriad of other trinkets from the Inuit before returning to England in 1854. What he did not do, and what he was roundly criticized for, was not going and exploring the supposed campsite on King William Island. As I mentioned previously, Ray was not ultimately interested in what happened to the Franklin expedition, but was rather more interested in exploring and mapping the remaining unknown portions of the Canadian coastline. Nevertheless, Ray made a report of his findings and presented them to both the Admiralty and the public. Regarding the expedition's fate, he surmised that they must have died attempting to reach Great Fish River, whereupon they hoped to sail up it towards a friendly Hudson's Bay Company trading post that would give them food and shelter. Of the expedition's last days, he wrote the following, quote, Some of the bodies were in a tent, or tents. Others were under the boat, which had been turned over to form a shelter, and some lay scattered about in different directions. Of those seen on the island, it was supposed that one was an officer, chief, as he had a telescope strapped over his shoulders, and a double-barrel gun lay underneath him. From the mutilated state of many of the bodies and kettles, it is evident that our wretched countrymen had been driven to the last dread alternative as a means of sustaining life. A few of the unfortunate men must have survived until the arrival of wild fowl, say, until the end of May as shots were heard and fresh bones and feathers of geese were noticed near the scene of this sad event. Unquote. Ray's report was met with disgust and outrage at the suggestion that British seamen would have resorted to cannibalism in order to survive. Newspapers almost universally reviled Ray for believing the Inuit, supposing it was more likely that they had savagely slain the expedition to steal their most precious metal. Even Charles Dickens wrote articles on Lady Franklin's behalf lambasting the report, 
But Ray stood his ground, and his findings were accepted by the Admiralty, netting him 10,000 pounds for his findings. After nearly a decade of wonder and frustration, Lady Jane finally came to accept that her husband was gone, laid down somewhere in the northern ice in pursuit of the long-sought passage. What she would not come to accept, however, was that the brave and pious Sir John Franklin had spent his last days turning to the same barbarity as the savages who lived in that ice-blasted wilderness. His reputation did not deserve that ignominy. And so, summoning every bit of her dwindling fortune and influence, she pulled every outstanding favor owed to her by important men, and squeezed every last bit of sympathy from the public to fund yet another expedition in search of her husband's true fate. Leopold McClintock, an officer that had led most of the sledging parties in previous rescue attempts, took leave of his naval duties and set out with 25 other men for King William Island. Like previous expeditions, he was detained by ice in Baffin Bay, losing an astounding 242 days. Finally, in August of 1858, the ice relented and he entered into the Arctic. He went down a myriad of straits and leads before sailing the ship into a strait off of the Boothia Peninsula, a little more than 200 miles away from the southern coast of King William Island. Already close to having lost two years, McClintock did what he did best, and he took to the ice by sledge in April of 1859. As the men made their way south, they encountered Inuit bearing Franklin artifacts, who told McClintock that they had taken them from a three-masted ship that had since been crushed to the west of King William Island. They said that there was the body of a big man with long teeth on board, and that they had taken wood and metal objects, some of which McClintock purchased from them. As he went further south, he encountered another group of around 40 Inuit who had plates bearing the Franklin family crest. These Inuit reported the same story of a camp of dead Kabluna on the south side of King William Island, though they said that the tents had since collapsed and many of the bones and artifacts had since been scattered. They told McClintock that if he continued south, he would find other bodies leading to the mouth of Great Fish River. McClintock's party continued on in that direction before turning back north for the island in May. There, on a gravel ridge, they found the first body. It was the skeleton of a small man with tattered clothing, who looked as though he had simply fallen down where he lay. Lying under the man's body was a journal that had since come to be known as the Pegler Papers, as they appeared to have belonged to the terror's captain of the foretop, Harry Pegler, though this body was obviously not his. It took years to come to this conclusion, because the entire journal is written with the words spelled backwards and with the last letter of each word capitalized as though it was the first. With bits of poetry, snatches of what appear to be a eulogy to Sir John, and strange references to unknown camps and coves. Nearby, the men discovered a cairn, which should have housed a message or some other scientific writing in a brass cylinder, but, alas, it was empty. However, twelve miles to the west of there, they did find a cairn with a note in it. It was in a brass cylinder that the Navy used to leave notes behind, where a small message could be left along with one's latitude and longitude, as well as a note in six different languages, requesting that the note's finder should forward the message to the Admiralty. This note was dated to May of 1847, and simply stated the ship's position, briefly stated that the ships had wintered at Beachy Island, where the graves had been found in the winter of 1846-47, to and closed by saying, all was well. This brief message is odd for a number of reasons. First, the date of the wintering was completely wrong, as the graves at Beachy Island proved that they had wintered from 1845 to 1846. Second, there was no mention of the loss of the three previously mentioned crewmen. As odd as all this was, the paper then goes on to inspire blood-chilling horror, as scrawled around the margins of the paper is a second note dated to April of 1848. This second message states that the ships Erebus and Terror had been beset in the ice since September of 1846, five leagues northwest of the Cairn. It then goes on in a meandering way to describe how the cairn this note was previously placed in had been lost, but the cylinder had somehow been found again, and now was being placed in this new location. The letter closes by stating that Franklin had died less than a month after the previous letter had been written, and that the total loss of life now stood at nine officers and fifteen men, and that the next day they would start for Great Fish River. It was signed by Francis Crozier and James Fitzjames, 
the now evidently senior officers of the expedition. McClintock made his way back north, and along King William Island he found other oddities, including boots stacked four feet high, various provisions and personal effects, and most puzzlingly, a boat with two skeletons in it. The boat was pointing northwards, away from the river, and was laden with all manner of odds and ends, and McClintock estimated that it must have weighed around 1,400 pounds. Strangely, many of these items served no useful purpose to Arctic survival, containing items like silk handkerchiefs, combs, sheets of lead, and dozens of books, including Bibles and a copy of the Vicar of Wakefield, and at least 40 pounds of chocolate. Why had these dying men chosen to haul such useless items when their very lives were nearly at an end? Whatever the case, McClintock felt that he had seen enough to form a cohesive narrative, and the searchers returned home later that year. There, McClintock presented his findings to Parliament and to Lady Jane. He believed that the ships had faced too much ice to continue north in 1846, and instead sailed south to the normally ice-choked Peel Sound. Not realizing that King William Land was really King William Island, Franklin had allowed the ships to become frozen in for the winter rather than continuing west. The ice returned and did not release the ships, and so the expedition was forced out onto the ice where they died sledging south towards Great Fish River. McClintock was careful to avoid any suggestion of cannibalism, and his report was widely accepted, earning him both knighthood as well as Lady Jane's gratitude. I'll go more into this in the next episode, but I do briefly want to mention that more artifacts and native stories were uncovered around King William Island by an American named Charles Francis Hall. Hall was a Cincinnati businessman who was so electrified by the Franklin story that he left his wife and children to look for more Franklin artifacts in 1860. He would go on to spend the next nine years variously raising funds and questing out into the Arctic, living with the Inuit and recording their stories. Their testimony provided more details on the camp at King William Island and how Crozier had parlayed with them and attempted to keep the men fed by hunting. They further reported that the camp had many books and pieces of paper that had blown around for years thereafter, but not understanding their significance, they had given it to their children to play with or otherwise use them to light fires. Hall was never quite sure, but he also believed that their testimony suggested that Crozier was amongst the last men alive and had led a few men further south towards the mainland. He went on to find remains, identifying some of them and sending them back to England for burial. The epilogue for this sad tale perhaps lies in the life of Lady Jane Franklin and the legacy she wove for her husband. Lady Jane spent many thousands of pounds of her family's money to finance expedition after expedition, obsessively seeking her dead husband. Such was her spending that her father eventually disowned her, leaving her to continue to burn through the money she still had from her dowry and properties in Tasmania. Once McClintock published his findings, Jane then set her attention to cementing Sir John as the discoverer of the Northwest Passage. The strange irony of Franklin's lost expedition was that the Northwest Passage was indeed discovered, but only by the rescuers searching for Franklin. Six years of confused sailing and sledging over frozen sea and desolate lands finally completed a workable map of Canada's waterways so that one could indeed see a connection from Atlantic to Pacific. However, by the end of these searches, this long-sought passage was essentially useless. In 1869, the year Charles Francis Hall returned with his story of the Franklin Expedition, was the very year that the Suez Canal opened, making a trip from Europe to the Orient a matter of only a few weeks rather than months. An actual continuous voyage of the passage would not be undertaken until 1906 by famed Arctic explorer Roald Amundsen, who was also the first man credited with having reached the North Pole. Decades of toil and loss were given up for a water route which was never used in the lifetime of any of its explorers and is today only used fleetingly. In spite of all this, Lady Franklin succeeded in securing the legacy Sir John had sought on that final voyage. She had statues raised in his honor, both in Britain as well as Tasmania, titling him the discoverer of the Northwest Passage. Friends in literary circles wrote stories, poems, and songs about the heroic and sad fate of the expedition and its beloved commander. And to this day, the subject of Franklin's lost expedition continues to be the subject of books, documentaries, and primetime television shows. 
While the search for the Northwest Passage was an ultimately futile exercise in national vanity, it had at least been undertaken beneath a thin veneer of practicality, of securing not only Britain's glory, but also its wealth with the addition of a new trade route. However, what remained at the ends of the earth had no such facade. The North and South Poles were a prize to be reached for no other reason than because they could be. Why go to the Poles? Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The space race before the space race absolutely was the race for the Poles. A race that saw contenders from nearly every European nation driving toward that one goal in hard and occasionally creative ways. That is what we'll explore next time when our series turns to look at Andre's Arctic Balloon Expedition. And in the race for the ends of the Earth, exploration would quickly give way to obsession, desperation, and eventually, tragedy. While the John Franklin story has reached its unfortunate conclusion, it wouldn't be right to leave the story here. The question of what really happened to the lost expedition warrants a full discussion, and next time on Ends of the Earth, that's exactly what we're going to do. My producer Michael and I are going to be breaking down the popular theories, folklore, and legends surrounding the lost expedition. We'll be exploring the evidence that backs up each of the popular explanations, and in the end, giving our own opinions as to what became of the survivors. If you've enjoyed what you've heard thus far, please consider following the show on your preferred podcast player, interacting with our social media channels, and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Your support continues to shape what Grizzly History becomes and can be. Grizzly History is a history podcast hosted by myself, Graham Parker, and produced with Michael Ruiz. For more information on the show, as well as links to our various platforms, please visit our website, grizzlyhistory.com. Finally, if you have any commercial or narration work that requires a voiceover talent, I am available and I'd love to get in touch with you. Please reach out to my email address, graham at grisleyhistory.com, and I'd be happy to talk to you about your upcoming project. Again, that is g-r-a-h-a-m at grisleyhistory.com. See you next time.